Thank you very much, everyone, for coming along today, and thank you to the Office of the Privacy Commissioner for organising it all. Uh, so my name is Andrew. Um, as Charles said, I'm a PhD candidate, and I'm working in the area of practical and ethical video analytics systems. So video analytics is this relatively new term that you may not have heard of before, but it's actually really all just in the name. Um, we take some video and we analyze it, so video analytics. Um, but when we analyze video, often we're looking for particular objects or things, and more often than not, those things are people. And so um, you, you can argue that video analytics is really just a nicer sounding term for camera-based surveillance. And so the system that we're developing at the University of Auckland, hopefully this works, um, this is the system that I've been developing for the last two or three years, is one where we can um, track people as they move around in real time using multiple cameras um, so that we can have these large camera networks and see how people move and use physical spaces. So what you see in this video is that I'm moving around um, and in real time at the top left hand side, sorry, right hand side, um, there's a map and it's plotting my position in real time. The system's running at about 20 to 30 frames per second on a standard desktop PC. Um, so this is, you know, um, real, right? This is stuff that we can do now. Um, and if I jump over here, um, if I bring another person into the room, we've all each got our own identification numbers. So I'm person zero, um, my student is person one, and it's keeping track of us as we move throughout the room. And so to do this, we need to use artificial intelligence and machine learning, embedded systems, big data, hardware software co-design, the Internet of Things, and a bunch of other buzzwordy technologies all together to try and achieve this end goal. And so my degree is fundamentally an engineering degree where I have to build the system, um, and the primary focus is on that application. But as I continue to work away at this, uh, something just felt a little bit bad at the back of my head. Um, I sort of felt bad about knowing that I was helping to create these next generation surveillance systems because I know that as with most technologies, um, this is not a value neutral system. It is, um, these systems can be used for good or for bad depending on who owns and controls the system. And so from Edward Snowden and the NSA to Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, information about us just seems constantly at risk these days. Technological advancements have meant that surveillance capabilities have accelerated away from our understanding and regulations around privacy. So I'm going to start off today by, uh, with an introduction to the problem space, what has changed recently, um, that means that we might need to talk about privacy and surveillance in new ways. Um, we'll meander through some of these new technologies, um, but I'll keep it relatively brief because it's not a technical talk. Um, and then I'll share some results from our recent survey about public perceptions of privacy. Um, and last of all, because I can't just talk about the problems, I need to also touch on how we might be able to use technology to help protect our privacy and what might be needed to get that technology in place. So right now, you're probably most familiar with camera surveillance systems in a law enforcement and public safety context. So that's airport immigration environments, CCTV cameras, um, facial recognition systems in China. And there's just a few examples of where cameras have been deployed on a massive scale, automated with the help of artificial intelligence. And so that Chinese example is particularly interesting because they plan to have full coverage of the entire country with facial recognition based tracking, um, including through smart TVs and smartphones by the year 2020, which is not that far away. Um, personally, I'm not sure if they'll necessarily get there based on the state of the art technology because I've you know, seen the papers and I know where the technology is, but that's sort of just quibbling about the deadline. Um, if it's not 2020, then it might be 2025. Still a little bit scary. But as the cost of deploying large-scale camera networks continue to fall and the abilities of artificial intelligence and computer vision or image processing uh, continue to rise, we're going to start seeing more commercial entities utilize these types of systems to gain insights into how consumers use and interact with physical space. So you can call this business intelligence. For example, let's say we have a supermarket. So there are a bunch of decisions um, that about how you set up that supermarket, how you structure the aisles, where you put the products that are known to have quite strong impacts on uh, consumer purchasing behavior. And up until recently, most of those insights have come from stationing human researchers standing in the corner with a clipboard and pen making notes about people as they shop. First of all, it's a really boring job um, and you can only get humans to observe people some of the time. And when people know that they're being observed, they tend to change their behavior. So if they know that they're being watched, they might not pick up that extra chocolate bar. So now imagine that we can set up a camera network that observes the shoppers all of the time, running person detection and tracking algorithms. So we can count the number of people in the shop at any time, determine uh, which aisles are most popular, and tell you which pass customers are taking. There are commercially available systems in place right now that can tell you if a checkout queue is starting to get too long and it will send an alert to the manager to say you need to open another checkout counter. 
Then you can collect statistics over time and start to answer higher level questions like, which products should I put closest to the entrance and exits? How often do we need to restock certain aisles? How many staff do I need to schedule in on a weekly basis? And if you really wanted to, the technology is there to allow you to answer some even higher level questions like, which items did loyal customer 362 pick up today but not buy so that we can send them a special email or a special offer later this week so they'll buy it next time? Or um, does the person who just walked in fit a particular profile that means that they're more likely to spend more and so we should send um, a shop assistant to go try and upsell to them? Or, um, and this is a real system that is in place now that you might have heard of before, is the person who just walked in the supermarket at risk of shoplifting based on their previous criminal history? And the supermarket might engage in secondary users of that data as well. So even if you're told that the surveillance camera system is there to collect shopper statistics, what if the supermarket then sells that data to the food manufacturers, or sells that to a health insurance company, or passes that uh, video feed directly to the police? So what is it about this scenario that I've presented that, probably, that hopefully makes us feel a little bit uneasy? Um, and, and, and the thing is that there can be relatively benign uses of surveillance camera technology, such as letting managers know when the queues are getting too long. Um, but it, there can also be much more controlling and more invasive uses. So as I hinted at earlier, I think that one of the big factors here is that the owner of the camera surveillance system is a commercial owner rather than the state. Ostensibly, whether it's the police or the National Intelligence Agency, if they have cameras around, you'd hope that they're there for your, uh, for your benefit, they're there for your safety. And you might have problems with that assumption depending on um, how many tinfoil hats you have, um, and that's okay. But I think it's pretty clear that when it comes to corporations, their incentives are going to be different. Um, they aren't going to be using this camera network for your safety, they're going to use it to find ways to make more money. And the benefit of having that surveillance camera network now goes to the corporation rather than to the general public who are being observed, whose privacy is actually being infringed upon. So when it comes to there being a trade-off between um, giving up some privacy in exchange for some convenience, there really isn't anything coming back in exchange for your privacy being lost. So I believe that this significantly changes the discussion around privacy and how we as a populace accept surveillance cameras. We've seen corporations increasingly use our data in invasive ways over the last decade or so. Things like Facebook, um, things like um, tracking your ad viewing habits online. Um, and soon they're going to add cameras to that mix as well as another source of data. So part of the problem here is that we're all actually quite used to surveillance cameras now. Even if you don't like them, you probably still walk down Cuba Street where there are CCTV cameras. And you can't really avoid them if you want to participate meaningfully in society. Um, you, even if you want to do something as simple as go buy groceries, you probably have to put up with the fact that there are surveillance cameras around. In a sense, the use of surveillance cameras for security and safety has desensitized us to the use of cameras for less publicly beneficial purposes, which is why we need to be a little bit more vigilant. Okay, so what technologies are threatening our right to privacy? So you can think about what you might consider the status quo at a large department store, say something like farmers. So most of the time, if you see a surveillance camera, one of two things is happening behind the scenes. Either the footage is being recorded and stored, and no one's going to look at it until something bad happens, or there is a human security officer that's trying to watch 10 cameras at once. So with computer vision and big data architectures, we now have a third option, um, which is getting computers to automatically process the footage and then just generate statistics or alerts for human supervisors. The technology is at the point where we can go fast enough to process this footage in real time. Um, and this is all going to enable surveillance networks to be implemented on a much larger scale. So rather than needing one human to struggle to watch 10 camera feeds at once, you can now get 100 computers to watch 100 cameras at once for roughly the same annual price or cost. And so there is a new sense of speed and scale that can be unlocked with AI and ML that means that these implications have now changed. And this is stuff that we couldn't practically do even five years ago, maybe even two years ago. So um, this is really like groundbreaking stuff that's sort of changing how we um, view this sort of system. And so this here is a video from Sense Time from about two years ago. Um, so they're arguably the world's most valuable artificial intelligence company right now, valued at about four and a half billion dollars. And they're the ones who are building the majority of China's nationwide surveillance system. So this facial recognition system runs in real time with real people in a real unstructured environment. You can see that it's performing matches against images from a database in a relatively unconstrained way. So the images that are in the database don't actually look that much like the unconstrained images that um, are being captured from the people walking, uh, coming down the escalators. Um, 
and, and while this system is being built for um, the you know, Chinese government, um, this, this company does offer these products to commercial owners as well. So you could start to see this sort of system popping up in, say, a supermarket. So the other thing that we can do is also combine data from multiple sources. So you may have read about people painting their faces with weird shapes to try and fool face detection systems like that one, um, or people advocating for wearing masks because it's not illegal to wear masks. Well, our research at the University of Auckland, so that video that I showed you at the beginning, doesn't use facial recognition. Um, it recognizes people based on their ap appearance, mostly based on the clothing that they're wearing at that point in time. Um, so our system is designed not to, give, uh, not to identify you to some global identity, so we wouldn't be able to say this person is Andrew Chen, but we would be able to say that this is person six, um, and they came in through this door and they swiped their RFID tag to get into the building, so now we know who that is. Right? Um, our research has, uh, other research has also shown that you can use gate recognition, so people walk in slightly different ways, so you can use that to try and um, discriminate, that's the word that we use, to um, separate between different people. Um, and when that fails, surveillers can track your phone. So sometimes they, they'll use a cell network, but more often than not, um, they, your phone is constantly reporting your MAC address over your Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Um, so if you're not in flight mode, then um, they can probably track where your phone is. And this is, again, a commercially available product that is often used in airports in particular um, to try and track how customers are moving throughout the, those spaces. And if any one of these systems fail, then we can fuse together enough data from those other sources to still get a pretty good understanding of where people are. And so for those who aren't familiar, this is actually happening in your backyard. Um, so NEC is a Japanese company that has been contracted to provide some, sorry, partnered to provide some person tracking services on Cuba Street in Wellington as part of the council's smart cities initiative. Um, I don't know if everybody already knows this. This is sort of this, was, this wasn't really news in Auckland um, because it didn't really affect us, but as it turned out, um, Auckland Council is looking at doing something similar, Christchurch Council is doing something similar as well. And so they use a combination of cameras, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth sensors, and they originally used microphones as well, but it turned out that the microphones were illegal, so they had to stop. Um, but the idea is that they want to know how many people are moving up and down a busy pedestrian route, at what time, at what speeds, to better inform pedestrian traffic management and to help urban planners um, have better information to work with when they're redesigning that space. So that sounds like good intentions, good use of the technology. Um, except it also turned out that the council wanted to identify beggars and rough sleepers so that they could try and get rid of the homeless. Um, and the NEC also publicly said that they wanted to sell that data to tourism companies and retailers. So maybe not so well-intentioned after all. And so the natural response to this sort of system is to um, think of ways to defeat these systems as an adversary. Um, so you can change your clothing regularly, you can um, put your phone in flight mode when you're not using it, you can take a ministry, uh, you can take a lesson from the Ministry of Silly Walks to try and learn how to change your gait. Um, and you could try to legislate against very specific technologies. So in the United States right now, there's a debate about whether or not they should ban the use of facial recognition technology, um, largely based on the fact that facial recognition, uh, facial recognition technology right now doesn't really work that well, so they think that it's going to lead to all sorts of um, problems um, from the fact that there are errors. Um, but I think that there are always going to be ways that technology will be developed further, right? Um, to defeat those methods, the, 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 the technology is just going to keep advancing beyond whatever defences you put up against it. Um, so if that happens, all you end up with is just an escalating war against technology, and we've all read enough science fiction to know that that doesn't end well for the humans. Um, so we can stamp out one type of surveillance, and there will just be others that will come in and fill the gap, um, that will be used and exploited by unscrupulous system owners. And so. I think that the technology will evolve beyond the narrow definitions that we can offer in the law. Instead, we need to ask ourselves some slightly different questions. So who actually wants these systems to exist? Who is paying for the development and installation of these surveillance systems? And then we can ask a slightly deeper question. Why do they want these types of systems? And how do we as consumers or the electorate accept or reject these systems? Okay. So when I told my supervisors that I wanted to do some research on privacy, their first response was, but you're doing an engineering degree, so where are you going to get the numbers? Um, and in my head, I was just thinking, well, I mean, it's ethics, so I don't know where I'm going to get the numbers. But as it turns out, you can just run a survey, and then you have numbers, so I can put it in my thesis now. Uh, <laughs> so what we wanted to know was what makes people feel more comfortable or less comfortable about the presence of surveillance cameras and how they're used. Um, we know that not all surveillance cameras are necessarily bad. 
Um, and you can have good intentions mixed with good purposes and good system owners and maybe things will be okay. Um, but I think that it's the people who are being observed who should get to decide or make a judgment of what good actually means. So we had some hypotheses about what might affect people's perceptions of privacy. One of the initial hypotheses was that privacy perceptions may differ depending on your demographic characteristics. So for example, it's been argued that women feel safer if there is camera surveillance in order to deter criminals. Um, similarly, it's also been argued that women are wary of camera surveillance because they feel that cameras are sort of voyeuristic. Um, so there have been a lot of arguments in the literature that basically say that particular demographic groupings feel a particular way, the problem being that sometimes these feelings are contradictory. Alternatively, people may have belief systems that make them feel more pro or anti-surveillance camera. So this isn't necessarily related to political ideology, but it is, in a sense, a way of thinking that might bias someone's view towards cameras or against cameras. But we also know that privacy is not absolute. So privacy is not always on or always off. And the context can make a big difference. So maybe the context is the biggest driver of perceptions. Um, but if so, then what is it about that context that changes people's perceptions? So I can give you a quick example of why the scenario might make a difference. So let's say there's a CCTV camera outside a fast food restaurant, like a McDonald's, um, for public safety purposes. And it's there to stop criminals. But it'll probably see you as you walk inside. And if you're not a criminal, you might not care. You might say, well, I've, I'm not doing anything bad. I've got nothing to hide. But that might change if you're supposed to be on a diet and you know that your friend works at the company that monitors the surveillance cameras. Right? Or it might change if the data is being extracted and then being sold to a health insurance company who will raise your premiums if you go to McDonald's too often. It's physically the same camera, it's doing the same job, it's doing the same function, but um, how it's being used, who is in charge, and your own personal circumstances can have an impact on what privacy means to you in a particular circumstance. So we designed this as a mixed method survey. And um, so that we had both quantitative scores to get numbers and also qualitative comments to go beyond the numbers and get a sense of emotion and feeling. So in contrast to previous research, um, our survey was designed to be a little bit more subtle. So rather than just asking questions like, do you like surveillance cameras if they're being used for public safety, which is a very narrow question, um, we use scenarios. So short stories that provide a bit of detail about the context in which the surveillance cameras are being used. So I've got a short one here. So let's take an example scenario and try to put yourself in the situation where you're the person that's being observed by this camera system. So the organizers of a city marathon want to use cameras to track the runners in order to prevent cheating and assist with health and safety. Trained referees will be watching the footage in real time and the runners are identifiable. The footage is also recorded in case it needs to be replayed during a dispute. The footage may capture the spectators as well, although there will be no identifying information for non-competitors. So the question that we put to the respondents was, how comfortable do you feel about the use of cameras in this scenario? So in the survey, we asked on a scale of one to seven, but we only have five fingers. So if you feel comfortable, you can participate. You can just hold up one to five, one for not comfortable at all, five being very comfortable, this is not a problem. And you can just hold up your hand to say how you feel about the use of cameras in this scenario. Okay, most people feel pretty comfortable. So one of the interesting things is that it depends on um, your personal characteristics, whether you identify as being one of the runners or being somebody who's standing on the sidelines. So that's one of the factors that actually does make a difference. Um, and so why did we choose to ask about comfort instead of directly asking about privacy? Well, privacy often seems like a rational word um, that makes people think about privacy rights and legislation and what is right and wrong. We wanted to go a little bit deeper and understand people's emotions beyond what they think is necessarily legal or not. So how surveillance makes people feel is perhaps even more important than whether it is perceived to be legal or not. Um, and comfort is also an important part of understanding social license, or in other words, how easily these types of surveillance cameras might be um, accepted by people in a society. So we started coming up with some hypotheses about some factors that might make a difference to people. Um, and then we use these when we were drafting the scenarios, um, knowing that there are going to be other contextual factors um, that would be left unclear or ambiguous that would be filled in by assumptions made by the respondents. And so we use 10 scenarios in total, which combine these factors in different ways. And the strategy is that um, you try to look for different combinations of factors between these scenarios and you try to find commonalities to try and identify what is common between these scenarios. So all of these scenarios um, were based on current day technology that could be implemented, if not now, then very, very soon. And so we had about 230 respondents. Um, it was largely a New Zealand um, set of respondents, although we had some internationals as well. Um, and we had a pretty good diversity of um, 
gender, age, and ethnicity. Um, but I need to acknowledge here that we had about 95% who had completed a bachelor or tertiary qualification, um, which is a, 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 um, a representative of the population. So it is a little bit more biased towards a highly qualified. Okay. So first of all, we tried to see if there were any relationships between um, demographic groupings and feelings towards surveillance cameras. And in our study, we found no statistical, statistically significant correlations with any of the demographic variables. Um, so this included binary gender, age, level of education, ethnicity, country of origin, country of current residence, occupation, and work experience with surveillance cameras. Um, so the respondents in each demographic category were basically um, distributed between liking cameras and not liking cameras. Um, and, and, and so this would perhaps support an argument against the hypothesis that demographic groupings make a difference. Um, and, and, and this is perhaps an obvious conclusion to draw in that what you are doesn't define what you believe. Um, but that hasn't necessarily stopped councils from justifying the installation of surveillance cameras by saying that women prefer to have surveillance cameras in their network. Um, and this is at odds with a lot of the established literature, which tends to suggest that marginalized groups are more wary of surveillance. Um, so we're not entirely sure why. It may be to do with sample sizes and you know, who actually responded. Um, but for whatever reason, in this particular survey, we think that um, the demographics don't matter. Okay. So, Maybe demographics isn't a good predictor of how people feel about surveillance cameras. Then maybe their ideology is. So after each scenario, we had a free entry text field that invited respondents to provide a reason for why they felt comfortable or uncomfortable. Um, and this is actually probably the most valuable part of our data. Um, so the vast majority of respondents wrote something, which is always nice. Um, and this enabled us to find some of those underlying emotions and justifications beyond just a number between 1 and 5 or 1 and 7. Um, so based on all of this, we grouped all of the respondents into four clusters um, based on their similarities, um, getting some sense of the underlying ideology or beliefs about camera systems in general. So cluster one were generally pro-camera or uh, also um, we call them apathetic. So we're very, they, they often had very few concerns because they generally believe that either the positive value of the surveillance camera was strong enough to justify existence or that these systems actually already exist and nothing bad's happened. So commercial uses of extracted data were seen as a natural ex extension from the existing um, public safety camera surveillance uh, infrastructure. And many respondents mentioned that there is no reasonable expectation of privacy in public, um, which is one of these common phrases that you often hear in this area. Um, and that if you're not doing anything wrong, then you have nothing to worry about. So one particular respondent commented um, that this is a common sense use of camera technology for everyone's benefit, um, which I think sort of sums up that cluster. Cluster 2 was a little bit more cautious. So they focused more on the potential abuse or misuse of camera systems, such as the potential for discriminatory profiling or individuals during shoplifting detection. Um, so what sorts of factors might feed into how you, how you decide who might be a shoplifter or not um, that could be um, discriminatory. Um, so here we're starting to see some themes of power and control, those sorts of dynamics coming through. And cluster three were a bit less comfortable than cluster two, um, but they focused on the owners of the camera network. So they tended to distrust corporate owners, saying that they would derive significant commercial value out of the data extracted from these networks, while providing little to no direct benefit to the individuals being observed. And concerns were raised about the collected data being unsold, and there was a deep sense of mistrust about the motives of corporations. And cluster four were consistently anti-camera and very, very anti-camera once we started to get into this area. So the main theme here is about trust. Um, so respondents didn't trust surveillance camera operators to follow processes and behave professionally. They didn't trust camera network owners to be honest about the stated purposes or, or characteristics of their networks. They didn't trust the data be sorts, to be stored securely. They did not trust safeguards or checks and balances to operate correctly. They did not trust algorithms to be functional or non-discriminatory. They did not trust governments to be accountable or competent. Um, they did not trust corporations to not sell their data. They did not trust anonymized data to remain anonymized. Um, and so one of the things that we found that was quite surprising is that actually a lot of the people who are in this cluster basically didn't believe the scenario as we wrote it. Um, so we would present a scenario like that and they would say, yeah, yeah, sure, the system owner says that, but what are they really going to do with that data? Um, and it's important to note that that's, you know, if, if we assume that the um, number of people in each cluster represents the percentage in the population, then there's about a quarter of the population who feels that way about surveillance cameras. So it's not, it's, it's not just a fringe extremist group who are believing this. However, 
these themes and ideologies are not universally consistent. So when we looked at the comments across the different clusters, there were still quite a few similarities between them. So the most favorable scenarios overall were the disaster recovery. So we had a scenario where we said that after a natural disaster, a uh, city council might use drones to go around and survey the damage. Um, and another one which was traffic analysis. So we were going to stick some cameras on top of every single traffic light and monitor how cars are using the roads. Um, and these ones were perceived to be more okay because uh, there are stronger benefits for everyone. So not, not even just the person themselves, but for other people. Um, and the potential for abuse is less, because in those two specific cases, we said that the data would be anonymized. Um, and the least favorable were, obviously, the intelligence agency person tracking 24-7 across the whole nation is an obvious target for um, anyone who doesn't like surveillance cameras, but also um, advertising analytics. So we had a scenario where you had a smart billboard that had a camera that could watch the audience and figure out um, the gender, ethnicity, age split of the audience that happens to be looking at the billboard and change the ad depending on who's looking at it. Um, so people really hated that one. Um, and also the supermarket motion tracking, where we said that um, when people come into the supermarket, um, they're, they're going to be tracked and how they move, and we're going to tie that to your loyalty card when you go through the checkout. Um, so people hated those ones because um, the, the, some corporation was going to make more money out of it, basically. Um, so what this bit of analysis told us was that actually maybe the context is the most important thing. Um, because even if you have some underlying ideology that means you're pro, more pro or anti-camera, um, it turns out that the specific factors within the actual scenario itself dominate or they can push you towards it being even more pro or anti of those cameras. So even the most cynical respondents were able to find some merit in using drones after a natural disaster. Um, and even the most pro-camera were a little bit wary of having a 24-7 nationwide person tracking system. Um, so, what were the most significant underlying contextual factors? And if I'm, depending on who I'm talking to, if I'm talking to engineers, I say, these are the things you need to think about when you're creating your system. And if I'm talking to um, social scientists, I say, these are the things you need to look for when you're trying to dismantle um, a camera surveillance system or trying to shut it down. Um, so, the things that people seem to care about, first of all, access. Who has access to the video feed or footage, including any secondary data derived from the cameras? So the perceptions tend to change if the data can be accessed by three government, trusted government officials versus any one of a thousand corporate employees, for example. Human influence. Is there a person in a loop? So because our scenario is focused on some of, some of the scenarios had a lot of artificial intelligence involved that could automatically process that data, um, what we found was that um, people did care if there was a person in the loop or not. Um, so people tend to feel better if uh, the footage is being recorded in a public safety context, um, and this sort of makes sense because you probably want evidence for things like courts. Um, but in a commercial or corporate setting, people felt more comfortable if the co uh, computer processed the footage and no human ever saw it. Um, and, and that's something slightly different because that, that requires the use of computer vision, um, which is a technology that most people probably aren't that familiar with. The third one was anonymity, so are the observed people in the footage personally identifiable or anonymous? And perhaps more importantly, is there the potential for personally targeted actions as a result? Um, so in all cases, respondents felt uncomfortable if they were not anonymous. Um, data use, so how will that data be used? And is the purpose in the public good or pro providing benefit to the observed, or does all the benefit flow to someone else? And are there secret secondary uses of the data? And the last one is trust. So do we trust the owner of the surveillance camera network? Are they competent? Um, and trust is probably the hardest to understand because it applied to both governments and corporations, but in slightly different ways. Right? Because people trust governments and corporations to different extents. Um, there was no sort of uniformly everybody trusts the government more than corporations or vice versa. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a big mess. But the underlying message was basically the same. Um, if there is a trust deficit where people simply do not believe what the owner is telling them um, or we do not believe that they have good intentions, then people will feel uncomfortable and they won't want to participate. Importantly, we should also know what factors seem to be missing. Um, so this is in comparison to other literature or privacy perceptions, uh, uh, literature on privacy perceptions or um, existing protections that are offered in our legislation. And probably the biggest one that was missing was consent. Consent is um, a huge thing that we often talk about, but very, very few respondents said anything about the issues around consent. 
Possibly this is due to the scenarios being framed in a way that meant that people didn't really have a choice um, to participate. But also there is a hypothesis that um, the idea of consent when it comes to surveillance cameras or just cameras in general has sort of eroded away in the digital age. That no one really thinks about consent anymore before they take a photo of someone. Um, and this is an important factor to, to consider because um, this may sort of represent some evolution of our ideals and principles as a society. Um, second one is also uh, that no one really mentioned anything about being able to see and correct your data, even though that's one of the information privacy principles in the Privacy Act. Um, and very few people were worried about how long the data might be stored for, um, with most people just making the assumption that the footage, if stored, will be stored forever. Um, and I think that this is somewhat consistent with how we've now been conditioned to know that the internet never forgets. Um, once something is stored, um, it's not unstored. It's, it's very rarely deleted. Okay, so now that we have some idea of what people care about when it comes to surveillance cameras and what makes them uncomfortable, what can we do about it? Um, what can we do to protect people's privacy when it comes to surveillance cameras? And so we have sort of two main pathways. The first is that governments can pass laws that protect our privacy by requiring system owners to play by rules, such as banning unconsented secondary uses of data, requiring footage to be deleted within a set time frame if unused, requiring opt-in rather than opt-out approaches to consent, requiring transparency or reliability tests for algorithmic processing of footage, um, and so on. And in, so in New Zealand, we're lucky that we have this principles-based privacy legislation that is very flexible and covers a lot of cases and would probably cover a lot of those things already if it's not written down explicitly um, in that way. But the other tricky part then comes in actually enforcing these laws. So we'd have to regularly audit these surveillance systems to ensure that they're compliant and make sure that they're doing what they say they're doing. Um, and we actually have to have proper punishments available for those who turn out to be infringing upon the privacy rights of individuals. So the GDPR in the European Union is starting down that direction, but here in New Zealand we're still quite a while away. Um, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner really just doesn't have the tools that it needs right now to be able to really strongly enforce our privacy legislation. And the other approach is to protect privacy by design. Um, so technology developers like myself should or must um, build privacy into their products such that privacy becomes much harder or impossible to infringe upon. So here's one I made earlier. Um, we've got something at the University of Auckland that we call the privacy affirming architecture. So what we're doing is that we're using smart cameras which allow some processing to be done at the point of image capture. Um, and this means that the footage doesn't actually need to be stored or transmitted. So it does depend on what your end application is, um, but in some cases you don't actually need to see the footage. Um, so this means that the image can be deleted immediately once that first stage of processing at the top is complete. So for example, in a commercial context where you just want the high level statistics about how a supermarket is being used, the footage would never be seen by a human. It would just be automatically processed um, and you just get anonymized statistics out at the other end. Um, so a system like this sort of forces system owners to respect the privacy of um, individuals because even if they wanted to be voyeuristic and spy on their customers, they can't because they can't get access to that footage. It takes one tool away from malicious system operators who would otherwise abuse that source of information. And I don't profess um, that this will solve all of our privacy problems, um, but it is one step towards protecting the privacy rights of individuals by default. Um, and you can sort of see why um, you need technologists to also be engaged with this sort of thing, because no legislator would come up with this, right? No person sitting in parliament would be able to go, ah, yes, we need to put this in the law, because they don't necessarily know that it exists until someone has developed it. But we have to acknowledge the weaknesses of our two approaches as well. So governments are slow, and they cannot respond to the pace of technological development that creates these sorts of threats and dangers. Legislators often aren't expert enough in these areas, and they rely on outside information that is amplified by money, which means that the information that they get is more likely to be in the interest of system owners rather than in the interest of the general population. And the biggest problem with protecting privacy by design is that some people who are opposed to that idea argue that it's incompatible with capitalism because there are real costs associated with developing privacy affirming um, or privacy conscious camera systems and someone has to pay for it, right? Um, and system owners just aren't incentivized to pay for the development of these types of systems. Um, and if you're a corporation, 
you might actually want to infringe upon people's privacy so that you can get better data to sell them more stuff. If you're a government, you may actually want to infringe upon people's privacy to um, control your population better. No amount of this technology on its own is going to be useful if the people responsible for implementing and owning these systems choose not to use it. And so how do we combat these deficiencies? Well, the power rests with the people, with all of us. And this is the third pathway, which is about education. So a more educated populace that knows more about the ways that these surveillance cameras are used, that knows more about the threats and dangers of these systems, that knows more about the potential downside of abuse by system owners, and that knows more about how we can use legislation and technology together to make things better, can exert power in other ways. So whether that's participating in the democratic process, or using uh, market forces to tell corporations how we feel. In the same way that governments and corporations can control people, they also depend on people um, who have opinions and feelings that have to sort of eventually be respected. Um, so really, what we need is both regulation and technology together to sort of go, come along side by side, um, but they can only really happen when the people push for improvements in both directions at the same time. Ah, yeah, that's the last point. Um, and that's why I do talks like this. Um, so sometimes the content can be a little bit scary, and I probably should have done a trigger warning at the beginning. Um, but I've seen the academic papers that describe how large-scale surveillance cameras can be practically achieved in the real world soon. Not in 50 years' time, not in 20 years' time, but genuinely soon. Um, even here at little old New Zealand, we've got a PhD student working on creating one. Um, so I want to try and get the word out that this technology is coming. And if we're too complacent about it and let that surveillance happen to us without doing anything about it, before we know it, we might be living, living in a science non-fiction dystopia. Um, so there's a quote that is often attributed to Thomas Jefferson, but it turns out that he never actually said it. Um, but it makes a good point, so I'll close with it here anyway. An informed citizenry is a vital requisite for our survival as a free people. I hope that if we can all become more informed, then we can do more to fight against these poor uses of surveillance technology and keep more of our freedoms. Thank you very much for coming along to talks like this, for continuing to learn, and for keeping your minds open to these new thoughts and new ideas. Nami hi nui, kia katoa katoa.